So today we're going to have uh, Don Moore speaking. Um, hi, Don. Uh, and we're going to be joined by a series of panelists who are going to be discussing Don or interrupting Don and asking questions along the way. Uh, I'll introduce them. Those are going to be Julia Minson, Jack Soule, Liz Tenney, Dan Walters, and Paul Winschittel. In addition, uh, Joe Simmons and Yuri Simonson will be with us as well, who will also be ready to interrupt and ask questions along the way. For all of you who are listening, uh, you'll see that there is the opportunity to ask questions or make comments through the Q&A portion. Any comments or questions that you make will go uh, by text to all of the panelists, as well as to Don, who will hopefully be too busy speaking to read them. But the panelists can read them and can interrupt Don and ask those questions. And even if we don't get to your question, that question might get to Don after the talk is even finished. So if you just want to compliment him on his haircut, that's also a good venue to do it. All right. So with that, uh, Don, it is all yours. Thanks, Leif. Uh, when I began my 20-year obsession with the study of overconfidence, I dreamt that someday I would be able to share my results with the Data Collada seminar series. So this represents the culmination of a career dream. Um, and I am thrilled to be able to share my research with you today. So uh, I've been studying different forms of overconfidence for a while. Today I want to talk about over precision. And I want to begin with a quote from Catherine Schultz, a journalist who wrote this wonderful book called Being Wrong. And in it, she describes an epistemological conundrum that's confronted when she tells people what her book is about. And they say, oh, you should write about me. I'm wrong all the time. And she follows that up by asking, oh, that's interesting. What are you wrong about right now? To which they have no answer. They can't. The things they believe are the things that they believe to be true. And she writes, we can be wrong or we can know it, but we can't do both at the same time. Hold that thought. I want to begin by distinguishing the three different forms of overconfidence and present to you a theory that I think does a better job accounting for the empirical evidence than do other popular theories, and I'll review them in turn. I'll then explore, uh, I'll present a, a study with people uh, that, that um, illustrates uh, the um, epistemological conundrum and its uh, consequences for over precision and judgment, and then uh, talk about a curious implication that computers will be over precise just like people are. And then I hope we will debate and discuss. So um, some of you may be familiar with my um, research distinguishing overestimation, overplacement, and overprecision. I don't get credit for distinguishing these. Jack Saul gets more credit than I do. But um, I think the um, explanations that have been offered in the literature for overestimation and overplacement are better than the explanations for overprecision. Its robust persistence remains a bit of a mystery, one that I hope to address at least in small part today. So the evidence suggests that we find overestimation on hard tasks and underestimation on easy tasks. People overestimate control when it's low. This is the illusion of control, most famously demonstrated by Ellen Langer on chance tasks, where people have zero control. Of course, they overestimate it. Um, with Francesca Gino and Sam Swift, we found that when control is high, people underestimate it. Uh, people tend to overestimate speed at on complex tasks. This is the planning fallacy. We under, uh, underestimate how long it's going to take to get things done. People tend to overestimate how long it's going to take them to get things done when the task is uh, simple and uh, is um, resolved quickly. This is the hard easy effect, well understood and well documented for quite some time. Overplacement is most pronounced on easy tasks with underestimation, pardon me, underplacement on hard tasks. So people believe that they will win a trivia contest on brands of alcohol, an easy topic that lots of college students know, think they know a lot about. And they think that they will lose a trivia contest on Russian literature, as Paul Winchettel has shown. Um, on a hard topic, each person thinks, well, I don't know very much about that, but maybe someone else does. And on average, people think that they're worse than average. 
People think that they're less likely than others to experience rare events like winning the lottery and more likely than others to experience common events like using a public restroom. This was, of course, the confound that explains Neil Weinstein's 1980 finding that uh, he called um, uh, optimistic illusions uh, um, but that is uh, better explained by the frequency of events. It was confounded with the valence in his studies. So that's overestimation overplacement. I'm not going to say too much about them uh, in the remainder of today's talk. Instead, I'm going to focus on overprecision, the third form of overconfidence that is unlike estimation and placement that routinely show reversals, as, as I've already just described, it is uh, vanishingly rare to find re reversals of overprecision people claim to be more sure than they deserve to be for most elicitations, for most topics, in most of the ways that psychologists have studied it. Most famously, their 90% confidence intervals contain the truth substantially less than 90% of the time, often less than 50% of the time. This shows up in forecasts of economic outcomes, in beliefs about how our friends and loved ones will behave in the future. It manifests itself, as Julie Minson has shown, in resistance to persuasion or influence from others. We're too, too sure that we're right, and so reluctant to revise our opinions in light of strong evidence from others that well-informed, smart people believe different things than we do. Scholars in behavioral finance have used this to explain the otherwise puzzling rate of trading in the stock market. The no trade theorem holds that rational Bayesians cannot agree to disagree about the value of some equity. And so as long as there is a cost to trading, they will not trade. In fact, we see lots of trading. Why? Well, if traders are too sure that their valuation of the equity in question is the right one, they will be willing to trade uh, even in the presence of a well-informed counterparty who uh, may have information that they don't. It's common for us to be willing to put high stakes on the accuracy of our opinions. Sometimes that is shows that the effects documented are large, replica, replicable, and robust. Notably, the way you ask the question has a powerful effect on its size. Using 90% confidence intervals, people look pathologically overconfident, overprecise. 98% confidence intervals, even worse. For 60 or 50% confidence intervals, people don't look so bad. If you ask, as I have written with Kerry Morwich and Uriel Haran, if you ask for a full histogram distribution, you carve the space of possible answers into a set of mutually exclusive and exhaustive bins and invite people to assign probabilities to them, that helps a lot. People look a whole bunch better calibrated. Still over precise, but much less so. And there is a conspicuous shortage of explanations that do a good job accounting for the empirical evidence. Some popular explanations that don't hold up so well include the ever popular anchoring offered by none other than Tversky and Kahneman back in 1974 to account, to account for confidence intervals that include the, tr the truth too rarely. Their hypothesized explanation was that people anchor on a best guess and then adjust too little from it in setting the bounds of their confidence interval. If that were what was going on, then setting the best guess, stipulating the best guess first, should pound in the anchor and exacerbate the effect. In fact, the evidence shows it does the opposite. If you ask the best guess first, the confidence intervals are wider than if you ask the best guess after you've elicited the confidence interval. And even Foster offered a conversational norms explanation for overprecision in communication, noting that the many circumstances in life when audiences expect precision, even when it comes at the expense of accuracy. You want to know your friend's best guess for when 
they'll show up for the meeting, not their 90% confidence interval around that best guess. If that were the explanation for over precision and judgment, then variation in the audience and their expectation should have an effect on how much confidence people report in their beliefs. If you're explaining to your friend when you're gonna show up for the meeting, we should observe different levels of over precision than if what you're doing is a private communication to an experimenter who's made it explicitly clear that you will be rewarded for accuracy in your judgment. In fact, there is no published evidence that I know that credibly shows that variance, variation in the audience has a meaningful effect on over precision and judgment. And then of course, there are plenty of people who believe that over precision is some sort of motivated effect. We um, are over precise in our judgment because somehow it makes us feel good or it, it bolsters our ego. I know of no evidence suggesting that variation in the motivation to be knowledgeable or to make yourself feel good has any effect on communicated over precision in judgment. So each of these explanations uh, has, has profound weaknesses when it comes to explaining the empirical record. Don, hey, Don, can, I, can I jump in? Go ahead. Bring it on. Yeah, can I jump in? Um, I, I noticed you don't have confirmation bias up there, which is thinking of evidence that favors your focal hypothesis or your favorite answer. And I was wondering how you thought that might fit into the scheme. I, I did notice that it might be on your next slide. So I'll, I'll let you respond. Exactly. Hold that thought. Um, <laughs> so uh, what I want to present to you is a theory that I think is quite compatible with confirmation bias, with positive hypothesis testing, as uh, Josh Klayman has written about famously in his 1985 paper. So I think that the, the logic behind this theory is um, clearest for a question like, what is the height of Mount Everest? Where there's one right answer and an infinite number of wrong answers. A good Bayesian, trying to estimate how confident they should be in their favorite answer must take the strength of the evidence for their favorite answer divided by the strength of the evidence for all possible answers. That's a hard problem. There are lots of ways in which we can fail to do that. One of them is, as Dan Walters has written about, so for failing to elaborate Often there's stuff we know, but we functionally treat possibilities as zero, ignoring them. So we neglect the evidence hypotheses, as Jack has pointed out, due to confirmation bias or positive hypothesis testing or the curse of knowledge, that it's hard for us to recover states of mind that don't include the focal hypothesis as prominent in our awareness. We act as if we know the answer and can't consider other answers as viable in the same way. The human mind is much better at identifying the presence of something than the absence of something. And it's easy for us to focus in on a particular hypothesis and neglect all of the ways in which it could be wrong. This relates in, I think, uh, profound ways to what um, economists and sociologists have called model uncertainty or what physicists have called theory uncertainty. That is, um, there is a profound way in which we can't be sure that we're testing the right hypothesis, that we brought the right theory to bear to explain our empirical data. And so we will be, we will, we're likely to come away too sure of our favored hypothesis. Sometimes it's because there are too many alternatives to keep track of. Again, the Bayesian formulation, the good Bayesian takes the strength of the evidence for their favorite answer divided by the strength of the evidence for all possible answers. When the hey, set of Don, alternatives Don, is infinite, Don, can I interrupt you cannot briefly? Under yeah, Leith, go ahead. Sorry, just a question from someone in the audience who's basically asking if it's because part of it is uh, 
part of overprecision is the inability to keep track of all of the other other possibilities. Does that mean that overprecision tends to be exacerbated by, for example, cognitive load or cognitive busyness or something like that? Something that keeps people from being able to think about those alternatives? Um, it, it should be. So the theory would predict that it should be. Um, I, um, I don't know that that's been tested credibly. So um, the, a parallel uh, prediction that the theory would make on that score is that the more alternatives there are, the worse people should get. And um, I do think that there's some evidence for that. If you ask people their confidence about the outcomes of coin flips, they, there's very little evidence of overprecision. When the set of alternatives grows, um, you see more evidence of what looks like overprecision. Um, the, uh, as far as cognitive load manipulations, I, I haven't seen that done well, um, uh, I would, I, but that is a study worth doing. Hey, Don. Yeah. Um, Michael Doherty has some work and his, and his colleagues have some work related to <clears throat> overestimation when there's multiple possible uh, uh, outcomes overestimation of probabilities and that and the relationship between that to things like working memory and I think also probably some cognitive distraction manipulation so that would be a place to look awesome thanks I should get those sites from you I should note the deep consistency between the theory I've presented and support theory so support theory highlights our tendency to um, focus on a favored hypothesis and neglect alternatives, especially when they aren't elaborated, that simply elaborating uh, possible hypotheses and outcomes leads us to inflate the probability associated with them. Um, that is entirely compatible with the theory that, that I'm presenting here. So what follows from that? Well, explicitly specifying alternatives, reminding people of the ways they could be wrong should reduce confidence in a and the theory is articulated in humans, although there are some features in human psychology that suggest it might exacerbate it, uh, but um, it's, it's worth asking whether machines are overconfident too. They, although they may have greater processing capacity than humans, it's not infinite, and so they too will underestimate the Bayesian denominator. An illustrative study that captures the situation in which the set of alternatives is uh, large, potentially infinite, I asked 800 m turkers to identify the animal in this figure. There are just two conditions. Either the alternatives were explicit or they were implicit. Everyone was asked to estimate the percentage of others that would see that they would report seeing the same animal as they did and there were rewards for accuracy. When the alternatives were left implicit, that is, it was an open-ended response scale that did not draw participants' attention to ways in which they might be wrong or alternative answers, I just asked them, what animal do you see in the image above? And then asked them how, what percentage of others would see the same animal. In the other condition where alternatives were made explicit, I identified the two possible answers that the um, illustrator of this picture intended. Uh, that is either a, an alligator or crocodile, it's now pointing up, or a squirrel or chipmunk looking to the left. Now, by making the alternatives explicit, I substantially reduce the number of people who will say crazy things and therefore increase the number of others who will agree with you. So the percentage of others reporting they see the same animal as you did has got to go up in this second condition. But I went into it, pre-registered, bet that the, their confidence that others would agree with them would go down simply by virtue of the fact that I reminded them of a way that they could be wrong. That is, in fact, what the results show. These are, of course, violin plots where the width indicates the density of responses at each level. The dots indicate means in the two conditions with standard errors on either side. So confidence goes down as you make alternatives explicit and accuracy goes up. It functionally has to because 
they're a bunch of the red dots indicate actual accuracy, the percentage of others who say the same thing. Um, it, it, when it's an open ended response scale, some people say crazy things uh, like hippo or dog or whatever, uh, but they um, so agreement goes up in the explicit condition. Hey, Don, um, I know you have a lot of opinions about the Dunning Kruger effect, and one of the attendees asked about how Dunning and Kruger effects relates to over precision. And also it struck me, I hadn't realized this before, but for these results in particular, it seems like Dunning Kruger effects might be really relevant. Uh, work through the logic of that argument for me. So once you know, like when I first look at that picture, all I see is a squirrel. And then once I know, so I think everyone's gonna see squirrel. I don't even think crocodile or whatever is even a possibility. Once I know that crocodile is also an option, now I know a lot more about how much I know. And now I will be a lot less overconfident. So Dunning and Kruger's argument as formulated is about your lack of understanding of what, const what even constitutes good performance. I don't think that applies so cleanly here. I see, I see the argument you're making. Um, the, uh, Joachim Kruger has shown persuasively that most of the Dunning-Kruger effect, uh, Jack Saul also gets partial credit on this one, uh, that most of the Dunning-Kruger effect is regression to the mean. When performance is low, it's easier to overestimate it, and when performance is high, it's easier to underestimate it, which is a better explanation for the underestimated performance at the high end. The Dunning and Kruger uh, find they have some humility explanation that isn't as plausible as simple regression to the mean. And here, uh, it, they aren't, uh, regression to the mean would not predict this pattern of results, I don't think. Hey, hey, Don. Yeah. Uh, there's there's a question uh, on the question and answer that I'd like to to mention, and I think uh, I've I was also thinking of this as well. That there's another. It seems like there's two possible explanations here. Uh, one is, uh, are you aware that there that are you reminding people? Are people aware that there might be other possible answers? Um, and the other is that they actually see one of those possible answers. And so in the explicit condition, I'm wondering, you know, the, so some people are simply reminded, but they don't see, maybe they see the alligator and they don't see the chipmunk. And other people are reminded and they actually see, oh, there's an alligator and there's a chipmunk. It could be either one of those. And I'm wondering if it depends on whether they actually can see the other option. That seems like a different explanation than the one you proposed. Um, I'm not sure that it's a different explanation, um, but the <laughs> criticism that um, I hear uh, more incisive in that question is that my selection of this ambiguous visual stimulus is a tricky question that Gert Gerenzer would accuse me of having used to cook the books in this case. And to that accusation, I would respond by pointing to the large body of research results finding over precision um, with non tricky stimuli, where, like, I use pictures of people and where I ask participants to guess their weights, or studies that you've done with representative stimuli, where you get, you can get results that, that parallel these, where um, you give people more um, possible answers and their confidence in any given in, the, in their focal answer goes down. Let me draw an, an analogy between these results and a well-known phenomenon in computer vision. Adversarial Don, before, exam. Don, yeah. Don, before you get to that, sorry, a small, uh -huh. small question related to what we were discussing. The, yeah. One unique feature of the crocodile uh, chipmunk uh, stimulus is that when you give those answers, they're both good answers. What do you expect would it would happen if you simply gave people more terrible answers? Would they get more over precise? So if you said instead of alligator and chipmunk, you said alligator and blue whale and uh, redwood tree or whatever, 
would pe would people become more overconfident because those were very uncompelling alternatives? Um, in uh, thinking about how to answer your question, I realized that I've done a study that's relevant and that is a useful rejoinder to a complaint you made about another study that I actually aren't, am not showing today. Uh, if you present alternative answers that are good ones, that are plausible, that make people think, oh, maybe that could be right, you do get a reduction in confidence for the, their favorite answer. But if you present um, really stupid alternatives that are obviously wrong, um, in, in my results, what I get is um, either no effect or um, an increase in confidence in the focal alternative. Paul, you've done research along these lines, right? The that alternatives effect? You're, you're muted. Yeah, so I think there's evidence. Um, I'm remembering Steve Sloman had, and colleagues had some work on this too. If you unpack, um, if you unpack, this is related to support theory, if you unpack alternatives that are not very, um, that wouldn't have come to mind, you get, you get one effect. If you unpack alternatives um, that would have come to mind, you get a different effect. So the, the, the information you reveal to people in unpacking makes a difference on judgments of a focal uh, probability. And that, that's, that's runs parallel to this, this issue that we're talking about now. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the connection to computer vision is in um, examples that fool the computer. You can train a computer vision system on some corpus of photographs to distinguish cats from dogs from food. And if you know how that vision system is making its identifications, you can feed it what are called adversarial examples that'll trick it into misidentifying the picture with high confidence and thinking that this tabby cat is guacamole or inserting what to a human eye looks like noise with a picture of a panda and fool the computer into thinking that it's a given with very high confidence. Why does this happen? This happens because the training corpus is of finite size and doesn't include these tricky elements that you can then use to fool the AI vision system. I went looking for systematic uh, data sets with machines that were computing confidence and came to Watson. Watson was the Jeopardy playing AI system that IBM built to play against Brad Rutter and Ken Jennings in this exhibition round. I'll just play a clip from that. Final frontiers for 600. To push one of these paper products is to stretch established limits. Brad, what is the envelope? Good. Alternate meanings 800. Stylish elegance or students who all graduated in the same year. Watson. What is chic? No, sorry. Brad. What is class? Class, you got it. Final Frontiers 800. It's a four letter term for a summit. The first three letters mean a so type of simian. Conspicuously, Brad. Watson what is Apex? Yes. displayed its top three guesses and indicating confidence in each. Watson needed to compute confidence because it needed to decide whether to buzz in on a given Jeopardy round. And when confidence wasn't high enough, it wouldn't buzz in, as on this round uh, being shown right here. But if you look across all the rounds of the exhibition match, Watson was on average 32% confident in the answers it displayed, right? This is not just the favorite answer, but the favorite answer plus two others. And its hit rate was non significantly below that. I went in search of more data and found a nice programmer at IBM who shared with me a bunch of Watson's training data that provided some more larger sample size and a little bit of insight into how Watson operated. 
So insofar as I understand what Watson did, it generated a set of possible answers and then farmed the best 100 of those out to independent processors that attempted to assess the strength of the evidence for that hypothesis and then merged them all together to pick the best one of those. Of those 100 answers, most of them were bad. So on average, confidence in, in each one's being correct was low across the whole set, just 1.2% confidence. How often were, were those answers right? Less, only 1.03% of the time. That difference is statistically significant, even though small in magnitude. Watson was overprecise. Why? The original set of Jeopardy clues on which Watson was trained was of finite size. Watson learned to calibrate its confidence on that set. And there were questions that it would encounter later, including in this set, where the favorite answer was wrong for reasons that Watson didn't appreciate. And so Watson was overconfident in the accuracy of its answers. There's an interesting parallel there to the reason why humans are overconfident. Obviously, Watson has greater computational capacity, but it's not infinite. And there will be ways in which the real world is more complex than the training set. And so Watson will come away overconfident. The calibration curve doesn't look exactly like a human calibration curve. It seems like Watson's programmers were paying attention to the high end of the range where Watson was likely to be buzzing in and trying to help Watson not be overconfident there. But on average, confidence exceeds accuracy. I'm going to ask a question. Yeah. Watson. Uh, so I am surprised by your explanation of sort of the mechanics of what makes Watson overconfident. I thought you would go with uh, there being a limited subset of potential answers, the sort of hundred that get imported into the next round. And the idea that if there's sort of, you know, an infinite number of possibilities and only a hundred that get imported, then if you drop any that were good ones, then you're sort of overconfident almost by definition. And that seems that lines up with the squirrels and the alligators. Thank you for that. I will take that friendly amendment. Yes, that's what I should have said. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, what, what do I hope you remember from this? Overprecision may be an inherent feature of fallible finite thinking systems like us and like any AI we're going to build. The problem of AI overconfidence, I should notice, is fairly well known in the literature. Um, Bayesian approaches to neural networks uh, routinely run afoul of the problem of overprecision in judgment. That is, they come to conclusions in which their confidence exceeds their accuracy. What does that imply for the psychology of overprecision? Well, overprecision may be reduced by inviting people to think about exactly how they might be wrong, and it will be exacerbated by elicitations that focus people's attention in on the favored hypothesis, such as what I've called item confidence elicitations, where you ask, how likely is it that you're right? or confidence interval elicitations that invite people to specify a confidence interval around their best guess. You can do better. You can help people think through how they might be wrong with histogram or spies elicitations where, as I said, you carve the space of possibilities up into a set of mutually exclusive and exhaustive bins. It helps people think through how they might be wrong and helps them calibrate their confidence. I should thank all of you and the collaborators who've made the work I presented today possible and insert a shameless plug for my book that's coming out later this month. And I would welcome questions, arguments, disagreements. Bring it on. Hey, Don. Um, thanks for the talk. It's really cool stuff. Um, how do you square what you're saying with that earlier finding that you reviewed that 
giving a best guess actually seems to reduce over precision because I would have thought that giving a best guess locks in a hypothesis. And since that locks in a hypothesis, I would think that over precision should therefore be exacerbated. Uh, so how would you square it with that result? That's a good question. Um, it, it, oh, it, wise panelists, do you remember how Block and Harper explain the paradoxical effect of um, setting the anchor on the width of confidence intervals? I didn't know about that finding. That's why I, I was asking yeah, the question. I found, a weird it, I found one. it I don't think pretty surprising. my theory offers a particularly compelling explanation for it either. I can, I can put together something contorted, but. Uh, and then another question that also came up a bit in the, in the Q and A is that it seems like in the, I'm going to call it the squirrel study. Cause I think that thing is most definitely a squirrel. <laughs> um, but, but it seems like in one condition, you're really highlighting that there are two possibilities, right? And so like at least some subset of participants might be anchored on 50, 50, right? They might be like, well, 50% of people are going to choose one, 50% of people are going to choose the other. Cause I could sort of see it going either way. And then I know in other studies that you've done on this topic that you didn't present today, because I got I got to look at the paper that, that you've written. You also run studies where you give people the option in one condition to, to give the full subjective probability distribution. Um, and you compare it to a condition where they don't have that. But it, it just strikes me in, in, in that circumstance, it's, I'm just worried about at least some subset of participants having sort of a uniform prior and they're like, okay, well, you gave me nine bins to put things in, and so I'm going to put them equally in all nine bins. Or in the squirrel study, it's like, well, you gave me two bins to put things in, so I'm going to put them equally in two bins. Like, there's, like, one thing you could look at is do you get a lot of 50-50s or something like that in the explicit condition? Yeah. Earlier, I made reference to this study that Leif complained about, where I gave people pictures like this one and asked, how much does the person weigh? Hmm. And in one of the conditions, I just elicited their confidence in their favorite hypothesis. That is, what's the probability that the weight is within five pounds, close to your best guess? That was the one bin condition, is it within subjects manipulation, all those same subjects also answered in the nine bin condition where I gave them a wider range of possibilities. Your question asks, how many people in the nine bin condition just assigned equal probabilities to all? The answer to that is zero. Nobody did that. But um, Craig Fox, so this, this is the result. Confidence drops dramatically when you give them more bins to assign probabilities to. The red dots indicate accuracy. So they're over precise across the board, but that effect becomes less pathological if you give them more alternatives. Now, when I showed this result to Craig Fox, king of the ignorance prior, as you've articulated it, uh, he said, no, nah, that's not good enough, just because nobody actually reports the ignorance prior. Now, in his study with Bob Clement, they spent a lot of time dwelling on the fact that the median participant provided equal probabilities across all. But he was unperturbed by the fact that nobody did that in this study. Um, he said, as long as they start there and adjust from it, then you'll get this effect. Um, the uh, one potential rejoinder to that is this dud alternative outcomes result that I mentioned, where you give people stupid and implausible alternatives. I didn't do that in this study, but you give them answers that are obviously wrong, and it doesn't have the effect of reducing confidence in the focal hypothesis. So that's a partial answer. Another answer might be this other study that I ran for Leif, where instead of actually allowing, to, allowing them to assign probabilities to the alternatives, I just mentioned that they exist. Now, as I justified to him, I think this is a really conservative test of the hypothesis. All it takes is subjects not reading the instructions for the manipulation to have no effect. You get, a, the effect replicates, but it is dramatically reduced in size. Yeah, I think that's a good answer. I, I, I like this version of it. Like, I agree, it's very subtle and it's, it's gonna be extremely conservative, but I like that, like that test where you're not, you're not having them do anything with the alternatives. You're just mentioning, you're just reminding them that the alternatives exist. Hey, Don. 
Yeah. Hey, there was a question from Chris Umphreys that was in line with something I was thinking. He asks, is there an AI equivalent of the consider the unknowns intervention? Can we simply program in a fudge factor that accounts for the fact that machines can't cover all possible answers? Yeah, that is a great question that um, it occurs to most intelligent people at some point when they encounter the, the argument that I've made today. Well, can't you just, if, we're, if this um, natural limitation in the number of alternatives we can consider makes us overconfident across the board, can't we just implement some sort of brute force correction? We know it's gonna make us overconfident, overprecise, so we just adjust down our confidence uh, always. In principle, yes. And I think that you do observe that if you give people enough practice with clear feedback and incentives um, over a whole bunch of repeated trials. So you can beat people over the head hard enough with their over precision on 90% confidence intervals such that they widen their, their confidence intervals and get hit rates closer to 90%. If you give them enough practice and enough clear prompt feedback. But that result generalizes poorly and goes away quickly. Like you bring them back to the lab the next day or give them questions on a slightly different domain and their correction factor doesn't generalize so well. Um, if that's what people are doing, then you might expect sometimes to, it to, for that to induce under precision. That seems plausible. I, I don't know. I can't think of a, a demonstration of that result in the literature. Great. Thank you. Uh, Don, so at some point in your slides, you use the term inherent. It's an inherent uh, over precision as an inherent feature. And I'm so I, I have a two -part it was intentionally question. provocative. Thank you for picking up on it. Yeah. So can you say more about that? But then also, I've, I've you know, you, you sent me the paper. And so I saw in the paper, this relates also to Dan's question and your response. In the paper, you talk about the outside view and how an outside view as opposed to an inside view could, could be a different strategy by which people estimate um, their confidence. Um, so how does, how does, so given that there is the potential for an outside view, why should we be okay with saying that this is an inherent feature of the system? Um, it, it, your, your question is an excellent one. So the outside view um, invites the question, how often have I gotten questions like this right in the past? It is close to the brute force connection, uh, correction that, that Dan encouraged us to consider. And although um, that, um, can be helpful, it will be poorly attuned to the specifics that the inside view provides, right? The inside view asks, well, how good is the evidence for this one? Not what have I, what's my hit rate on questions like this? Like how sure am I on this one? I, that guy looks just like my roommate. And when I saw him on the scale this morning, it read 160. Well, so that allows you to calibrate more closely, right? If you just do the outside view, you'll get a flat um, uh, calibration curve where you just say, I don't care about the details on this one. I'm not gonna try to nuance my answers. I'm just, on average, I get problems like this, right? 60% of the time. But that, that's not satisfactory for anyone who wants to use the specifics of this question to make a judgment about this domain. Okay, for this bet or for this business partner, how sure am I that it's a risk, risk worth taking? Um, you can say on average, I've been overconfident about these things in the past, but this business partner is not the same as all the ones that occurred in the past. And so you're tempted to take the inside view and say, well, this time it's different, which is worth doing, a wise decision maker will attempt to do that sometimes. And I think when they do, they will be vulnerable to the processes that I've described. So you took me to task for the um, potential overclaim of inherent. Um, and 
the processes that I've described in the unknown theory, I mean, I, I think they're going to hold for any finite fallible thinking system. You can't track all the ways in which you could be wrong when there are an infinite number of alternatives. If human working memory is limited to seven plus or minus two, that is a pretty strong limitation in our ability to keep in mind alternative hypotheses. And it will make us naturally prone to coming away too sure of a focal hypothesis. Yeah. Thanks. Don? Yeah. I have, uh, I have a comment from the audience that I want to highlight, and then I also have a, a question. Um, so Nelpatnam Far uh, has an explanation I like uh, for the why is making a point estimate making people less over precise than offering a confidence interval? And her explanation goes like this. Uh, Offering a confidence, it strikes me that offering a confidence interval first narrows the range of possible outcomes. So overconfidence is a failure to keep track of the full range of possible outcomes. Offering a confidence interval first exacerbates that, which to me sounded uh, plausible enough to uh, welcome some more thinking. Um, Joe, what do you think about that answer? Uh, yeah, I'd have to think about it a bit more. I mean, I still, I guess I still don't understand exactly why giving a best guess doesn't narrow it even further. But like to me, like that's an explanation for why confidence interval elicitation leads to overconfidence, like in general. But it doesn't necessarily account for why giving a best guess first makes you give wider confidence intervals. Mm -hmm. But you know, I'm thinking about this on the fly, so maybe I'm not thinking about it very well. Can I jump in here? I was I was having uh, some technology problems when I think I tried to respond to that earlier. Um, but uh, the the reason I've always thought about this, which you know, may um, not sure if it's right, but basically, when you think about a, a best guess, a, a, a confidence range, you're kind of thinking about your best guess and focusing on that. Whereas when you give a best guess first. And now you're explicitly told to think about a low and a high answer separately. Now you're really kind of guiding your thinking to why might the answer be really high or why might the answer be really low. So it's kind of freeing you from thinking about reasons for your, for your best guess. It's, you're kind of deliberately searching evidence for extreme uh, answers if you make the best guess, uh, if that's included, if that's first. That's related to this um, curious effect that you have shown, Jack, where um, asking for percentiles in a probability, in, in a subjective probability distribution gets you wider confidence intervals than asking for a confidence interval. And the explanation that, that yeah. you offer that I find compelling is it relates to the way people search memory, the, the way that they think about the problem. So to clarify, you ask people for a 90% confidence interval and you get tighter confidence intervals than if you ask um, for the fifth percentile of the subjective probability distribution. So you say, give me a number that's so low, there's only a 5% chance the right answer is below it and a 95% right. chance the right answer is above it. And then you ask, give me another number that's so high, there's just a 5% chance the right answer is above it and a 95% chance the right answer is below it. Well, those percentiles define, ought to define a 90% confidence interval. But what you get is what's wider than if you actually elicit a 90% confidence interval. Yeah, and, that's right. Yeah. So the, the elicitations on uh, confidence judgments uh, have a huge influence on the implied confidence that, uh, or the accuracy in people's responses. Um, uh, and some of it, uh, as I've talked about today, is attributable to the ways that you prompt them to search their memories for relevant information. Yeah, that's right. I think a lot of it has to do with kind of how you search the space and people kind of naturally think about their best guess, but there are different kind of tricks or ways to get them to kind of broaden their thinking or think about very different answers. And I think the way I think about your work is you're kind of exploring the different ways to get think, people to think about reasons that are, that are different from the answer that they feel is the most likely one.
Don, the question I wanted to ask uh, earlier was, you're framing this theory as a theory about overprecision, but it struck me that it might apply to the other two kinds of overconfidence as well. Yeah. Uh, so uh, if I were to think about all the ways that I could have gotten answers wrong on this test, I might become better at overestimation. If I could think of skills that, you know, or training that other people have that I don't have, I might become better at overplacement, right? So I'm wondering if this is actually a broader theory than one that applies to overprecision. And what do you think of that? Um, when you say better at overestimation overplacement, you mean, I mean more less less prone to overestimation and overplacement. I will overplace less myself prone. less. Yes. Yes, 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 yes. So that is an oft neglected little uh, side asterisk on my results with PJ Healy in the, in the 2008 Psych Review. The more precise our subjects were about reporting their beliefs about performance on the trivia tests, the less they fell victim to over and underestimation and to over and underplacement. Now, uh, so let me, let me uh, unpack that result a little bit. The more sure subjects said they were of estimating their own scores and other scores, the less regressive their estimates were, and therefore the less likely they were to overestimate performance on hard tests, underestimate it on easy tests, overplace it on easy tests, and underplace it on hard tests. Um, now, that's probably less impressive because these were all um, endogenous variation in precision that we're examining. We didn't manipulate it exogenously. That would have been more interesting. Probably most of what that effect picks up is variation in the self-insight that people displayed into how they actually performed on the quiz. And the ones who actually know how many of the quiz questions they answered right, they will make fewer errors in overestimating or underestimating. But just to reiterate, this, this is a bit of a paradoxical result wherein more precision in judgment produces less bias in overestimation and overplacement. Uh, just building on Julia's question. Oh. Building on Julia's question about, uh, you know, is this broader than 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 just what you're focusing on here, um, even outside of what would be considered overconfidence? I'm I'm wondering about judgments of causality. I guess confidence in causal judgments, which is confidence. But um, so you know, if you're making a if you're trying to estimate the causal role of one factor, are you inherently prone to overestimate that? And I think there is some literature that has that kind of storyline to it. Yeah, yeah. I think you can pick that up in the behavior of our research participants, but most interestingly, you have identified this crucial issue in the behavior of us, the researchers. We focus in on a favored hypothesis and too easily neglect the evidence favoring alternative hypotheses. Um, our statistics are much better at uh, quantifying for us measurement error, and they're rotten at quantifying theory error or model error. When we've brought the wrong model to bear on the data, when we're focusing on the wrong variables, our statistics don't say, hey, here, you should have measured this other thing, or you should have controlled for this, uh, this other variable, or you should have specified this on log scale rather than linear scale. So we have to think of those alternative specifications and try testing them. But uh, because sometimes we will pick the wrong model, we will come away too sure of our research conclusions and um, uh, we, we, as researchers, even when we've um, done things right, uh, we're on the up and up with regard to just testing one a priori hypothesis, 
Well, unless we compare that to the set of all possible hypotheses, and um, Uri and Leif and Joe have suggested some ways that that might be possible, where you do a specification curve with um, a, a data set where there are a bunch of different variables you could consider. Um, that's good, that helps, mm, but there are some variables that you still didn't measure, and um, there are some specifications that you may be omitting in your approach to the specification curve. That will leave you as a researcher to sure of your favorite hypothesis or that the set of alternatives you considered is the right one. And on that confident note, maybe we should wrap it up. Okay. Any other Thanks so much for, for speaking today, Don. That was, yeah, that was so great. Much. And thanks everybody for attending, including our panelists and all of our audience. It's been great. We'll do this again next week. We'll have uh, Nina Strominger uh, speaking to us all again. All right. Thanks, thanks everybody. Thanks, Don.